There we go. All right, start right. again. Mm -hmm. uh, tonight our speaker is Catherine Knight. She uses a pen name of K.I. Knight and she's a genealogist, historian, author, keynote speaker, and a cemetery preservationist. She serves on the boards of several nonprofits organizations and has logged more than 20,000 hours over the last 13 years researching the first documented Africans to arrive in the English settlement of Virginia in 1690. And in 2016, as a National Advisory Board member and historian for the Project 1619, <clears throat> Catherine co-curated the 1619 First African Landing Exhibit at the Hampton History Museum in Hampton, Virginia. And she uses her as the Fate and Freedom series of her books, which a lot of her documentation goes into. And she has been, where? She's received awards from the Philip Wheatley Literary Award for the Sons and Daughters of the U.S. Middle Passage for the Unveiled, the 20 and Odd. So Catherine, what's up? Take it away and look forward to enjoying this. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. I'm clear. That bio Richard just read, it really covers the last 15 years of my life and it's been a long journey. <laughs> but I, what I would like you to know is the full picture because from the time I was three years old, I was being groomed to be what my family called the keeper of the ancestors. And which is basically a genealogist. Um, and you see, I'm first and foremost a genealogist. I'm a genetic genealogist, and actually I'm an investigative genetic genealogist. But what all of those things, achievements that I have, they all stem back to that three-year-old little girl picnicking in the cemetery with her great-grandma. She would tell me stories of everyone that was buried in the cemetery. Some of those stories I still remember today and, and over the years have documented them fully. So today I want to start with research. Now, research, everybody hates research. Most people do. But you have to make you have to make fun. You have to you have to somehow make it the investigation, you have to make it fun and interesting. Now there's lots of types of research methods. Matter of fact, there's probably about 20 up there that I've listed, and I've used every single one of them. Um, but today, we are going to talk about historical research, because really that's my genealogy and historians go hand in hand. Um, one cannot be without the other. And there's a collection of techniques and guidelines that historians use and research with and to write history. Those techniques are documentary, biographical, oral, archival, and geographical. Um, and the source types, there's three really. We use two mostly, and sometimes we'll bend for the third one. You have primary type, which is first person. Um, you have secondary, and then you have a preponderance of evidence, which primary sources is what you really want to strive to use when you're doing research. Now, those primary sources, you have original documentation. That documentation is usually recorded in the county records or the archives. A birth certificate, a last will and testament, all of these are first primary that, um, that basically, like your last will and testament, that was actually written by the testor, testor which was the person's will. So you could believe all that information. You, what we're looking for is believable information that you, there's no question of, and that is considered primary sources. Now, secondary sources is a little harder. And in order to, with genealogy, we like to have two or three sources to be able to even use that event or whatever we're documenting. Um, and some of those sources are scholarly books and journals, written in oral history, depending on the author. Um, encyclopedias, textbooks, funeral home records, headstones from cemeteries. And then you have, um, well, let me back up. Propon 
the reason I have this here, secondary, we talked about written and oral history, depending on an author. The reason for that I wrote that is because this document is actually what allowed many historians to um, retrieve colonial history. You see, all in the, the Revolutionary War, all of our historical records were burned in the courthouses. And there were, in order to document something back to a secondary source, you had to have who, who actually authored the document. And you needed a second document to verify his document, the first, the author's document. So what we actually looked upon was that the clerk of the court at the time had gone in and he was documenting um, what is called the minutes of the council meetings of the general court. So we actually, and then how we were able to use the second person because you need two doc two people to document it to make it a, a um, secondary source, we used a genealogist because the genealogist had also gone in and written everything down and actually the clerk of the court knew of this. So we were able to come back and reproduce all of those general council meetings, which is really important to the um, colonial history, writing history. And this is what that actual document looked like. This is another thing we deal with is look at the, look at the handwriting. Trying to read it can drive you insane. This actually is not really too difficult to read, but if you go back, this one was done in the, in the 1700s, middle to late 1700s. And if you go back to the earlier handwriting, it does get harder and harder to read. You, there's, there's letters that look like other letters. So you actually, you, you cursive handwriting becomes quite an attribute to know, being able to read these documents because this is what that actual document, that one page said, and it was in regards, it gives us lots of information because every piece of information counts. That's what we really need to know. Now, preponderance of evidence is when you can't come up with a, a, a source, like a primary or a secondary source, and you may have, um, I'll give you a, I'll give you a, a, for instance, with preponderance of evidence, in order for myself to join a lineal society, which was the um, descendants of the first Africans, I had to have evidence in I didn't have primary evidence because I had a brick wall that I, I couldn't get from one generation to the next. So with that brick wall, what I, how I was able to tear it down is number one was DNA. Number two was a, a deed. And the deed was connected the, my person to two generations back to her grandfather who owned the property. And we traced it through deeds. Um, but it was a preponderance of evidence because it didn't, it didn't trace specifically to my person. So in order to join these lineal societies, you have to, and you have to have evidence. So sometimes they will allow you to use a preponderance of evidence, which my DNA did back up that. So there was more to it than that, but we use documents that can get us there in research. Um, in genealogy, and this is the reason we use a proponents of evidence, is if you can prove it, it's genealogy. If you can, it's mythology. And literally, we, you can't use it. You have to throw it out. If you can't prove it, throw it out is basically what, it, what they say. Now, in the past, before computers, and this is how I learned, was I went to libraries. I went to state and county archives, to the tax collector's office. We went to cemeteries. And out of that, we at the libraries, we had encyclopedias, dictionaries, books, magazines, journals. <clears throat> but now we basically have search engines. And through search engines, we are able to utilize documents because most of them have been transcribed into journals, into there's lots of, of different um Websites which have search engines within them, as does JSTOR, which is, is very old historical documents. Um, instead of going to the cemetery, we have find a grave. You literally type in the name of the person. You can see, you, you can search the entire United States for this person with a date of, of when they were born and when they died. 
Um, so there's lots of, it's a, it's a whole different world when you're talking about research. You can literally do it from your home, you, all over the world. Um, what I want to say though with research, our earliest decisions as authors and publishers should be made after we've done adequate research. And that is a quote directly from me. And this is the reason that that quote came about was because when I became an author, I wanted to use my name, Catherine Knight, right? Jane uses Jane R. Wood. That's her name. Well, I Googled my name and up pop. The first one was an author. Well, then there was three Catherine Knights who were authors, which is a huge problem because when you're Googling, your search takes you all around the world. It takes you to every country. So if, if that your name is in that country, it's going to pop up, which is a big problem. Because in Australia, a Catherine Knight, if you look down at the bottom, she ate her husband. She killed him and ate him. Who wants to be associated with that? So I went to my initials. And the reason I did is because when I have a Google search, this is what I want to see. When I Google my name, I want everything that I have done recently, um, I want it to pop up on the first few pages. And any time that, that you Google your name, that's what you want to see. You don't want to see someone associated with being a cannibal. <laughs> um, so research is important because what if I use Catherine Knight? Every time somebody in Google my name, there she would have been. So research is very, very important. It's necessary for every author and publisher out there, period. Um, now, when we're writing a book, there's lots of research that has to be done because there's, there's a piece, there's puzzle pieces all over the board, really. Um, there, you have to know who, what, why, where, and how. And you have to know that with each person in your book, wh whether it's a place, a person, place, a thing, you have to do research. And by doing research, you have to become a detective. But I want to say one thing about that. When you become a detective, you wanna examine your assumptions closely because you want no preconceptions. Because the easiest research that you can do is with a clean slate, with no preconceptions, with, not, with, with having no foreknowledge of what took place. Because now you're not going to immediately discredit or, or you're going to search for, a, you'll have a bigger realm to search within. Hold on. Something just popped up. I don't know how that worked. Okay, um, there's something out there called cluster searching, which th this is a new technique. I don't know whether I actually am the one that created what is called cluster searching. Um, I've, I've used, used it. I, I, I really feel like I was the first one to do it. And when you go into searching something, whether it's a person, a place, or an event, you want to look at all the people that were involved, especially in that event, that are located from people in the places of that that's going on in the event. In other words, if if I was looking up in a certain company of of a military unit, and that military unit, um, you can put in specific battles. You can look at each person's name that was in those battles because those names are going to come back. We find that from in the historical records, we find people moved from place to place together and they were in events together. Um, and you will see that once you look in state archives, whether it's the census, you may look at the neighbors next to the to whoever you're researching, and you'll see the same neighbors if they were in, in Virginia, but well, they may move to North Carolina, but they all move together and all those same neighbors are there. So that's another way of documenting, which is, is what we are trying to do by doing research. Now, there's lots of lessons that I've learned over the years, and I have been in research 
Yes. Um, it started really when I started work. I started working from a title insurance company where I learned to do research in all the in all the records, title records. There's all kinds of things you have to research. I was I eventually became a vice president of a um, national home builder, and I had to do lots and lots of research. And research has really been the foremost of my say 30 years, 40 years um, in business. And the lessons I've learned, um, number one is don't rely on anyone's help and research. And the reason being is because we all look at books, right? Well, people write books like me, like you, and we have different preconceptions of, of what may be said in a book. So I was reading for research in this book by Benjamin Woolley, the name of it is Savage Kingdom, and it talks about in the depths of Somerset. Now he's talking about England and he's talking about America and Virginia at the time. And he didn't bring up Bermuda, but there is a Somerset County, England, which is what most people automatically are going to look at. But in this book, Summer's Isle was also Bermuda, and that's what they called it was Somerset. So you need to know your author because you can get things wrong. And then that true story is, continues to be shrouded where it was, it was written down. They were seen in the depths of Somerset. It, what the actual quote was, and it was it's in written, but he mi misunderstood it. It was written to Africans along with three of the crew seen in the depths of Somerset. But where that was found was in a Bermuda book, but he intermingled it with the English. So the story was not, you had, the story wasn't exhausted and you couldn't find the truth this was the problem of it. So you need to know when you're reading, you need to know where everything, where it's taken place, the geography of the, of the story, which is one of the things that we initially had talked about of research methods. Don't rely on anybody else's work. Now, the research lesson number two, when it doesn't add up, when you have something that just doesn't work, use your common sense because things can be wrong. And it can be in a really important quarterly histor historical journal, journal where it was written down. I'm not going to say which journal. I don't want to out anybody. But um I want to tell you what happened because it's, it's very important. Um, Engel Sluter, who is a researcher, he, is, he actually is of Portuguese descent. And he had found, he was searching in Veracruz, Mexico. Veracruz, Mexico was where one of the ports, it was a Spanish port because Mexico was New Spain back then. So he was searching in this, in this port and he had found these records and it uncovered a um, pirating, which was part of what I was working on in a lot of my research. And the pirating was of the San Juan Batista and it was listed in Portuguese. So my point being is no matter who writes the article, whether it's me, whether it is the most talented historian out there, it doesn't matter. You have to look at the entire document in full because what happened in this instance was on the bottom of the document, it just, it, the reason it didn't add up, I have to go back. The reason it didn't add up is because the San Sa Juan Batista, how he had written it was in Portuguese. It was found at a Spanish port, which a Portuguese ship would not be at a Spanish port. It would be at a Portuguese port because they were very different at the time. There was Spain and Portuguese were very separate. Um, it was a Spanish, well, it was a, um, there were attached circumstances, which was court proceedings that were Spanish court proceedings. There were several things that were pointed to Spanish. So I couldn't understand why this document was saying it was Portuguese. Well, lo and behold, I go to get the original document. You always want to get the original document. And there's one other thing I'll say about getting an original document is you want evidence because in the end, if you are doing a nonfiction and it's being edited, you want your editor to know where your documentation is and you need a copy of it. 
to source it. Um, sourcing is not fun <laughs> at all. Um, that is part of something though that has to be done is with research, research is sourcing your information. So going back, I had to look for the original document of that was written by Ingle Sluter describing this pirating. Where I found it, he, he had actually passed away, but his wife had donated all of his materials to the to UC Berkeley. So I went to the UC Berkeley Library, and in their archives, I found his original writing and document. On the very bottom of the document, it said, "I have translated this information into Portuguese from Spanish." That changed everything because now that the original ship that I was looking for was no longer Portuguese. However, it was documented as Portuguese in all the historical museums, um, in all the information located ev everywhere basically that I had seen it, but it just didn't add up. So when something doesn't add up, you need to research and, and hunt because in this case, the reason it didn't add up is because the ship wasn't Portuguese, it was Spanish. They had gone to a Spanish port and it was definitely a Spanish ship. But that did change the historical text of the entire story. So that's something that you really need to know. Now, research um, and how I have it is search, but we want to research is really how I look at the word research. Um, and lesson number three is listen to the universe. And the reason I put this lesson is because as a genealogist, we're a little different, I think. <laughs> Um, we can walk into a library and it seems like the book or some information that we need just falls right into our hands. It'll fall off the shelf. I've had this happen. I've talked about it in, in several meetings with genealogists and they all say the same thing. Listen to the universe. The universe is trying to tell you something. So the reason I bring this up is because um, well, if you look behind me, you can see that painting back there. When I was doing all my research, I noticed there were not any paintings of this event that I was working on, on which was the Battle of the San Juan Batista. So I actually commissioned a painting to be done, and I found an artist who does maritime paintings, and I loved his work. And at the time, this we hadn't come up with this picture at all i just wanted to see something with ships and when i found something i liked i went to him i the artist and i said can i use this and he said tell me about your ship and i told him about the ship and he said nope you can't use it i said why he said because basically it doesn't fit your historical period and that's not the kind of ship that you would use or that would have have been in use so I said, okay. He goes, tell me, tell me more about this ship. So I started telling him about the San Juan Batista, all the information I had tracked it. It actually was a ship that was a Japanese ship that was built in 1613 um, by a man named Dante Maru. And he, um, the ship actually took a, um, a bunch of priests from Japan into um Mexico or New Spain at the time, it made two of these journeys, and it's a very historical ship. It's one of the first sailing ships of its kind to actually go across the Pacific that's documented. Now, the reason I bring this up and talk about the universe is because it ends up that the painting that lured me to this gentleman, it, was, it seems like there was something behind it, and what was it was, now my this was a picture of the artist Richard Moore with his wife Toshi. Now, as I was telling Mr. Moore about this ship, I spoke to him probably about 30 minutes, gave him the information I had. He said, okay, I'll call you back. He called me back in about an hour. I really wasn't expecting to hear from him so quick. And he said, you're not going to believe this. I want to paint you a, a picture of this battle and I can get the exact specifications of the ship. I said, oh yeah? He said, um, my wife is a descendant of the man that built the ship. So you don't know where 
this, this journey takes you. Listen to the universe because it gave me an entire new dimension of where, of, the, of connections that connects basically countries all over the world. So now I was, I was doing research in Japan. Thank goodness for transcriptions. Otherwise, that would have been a mess. <laughs> um, anyway, I want you to have fun with research because research can, can get bored, can get very tedious. Sometimes you can't find what you want to find. You're, it's, you run into what we call a brick wall. So we don't want you to get overwhelmed, overwhelmed at times and be a grumpy cat. And this is the grumpiest cat I have. Her name is Scrappy and she lives up to her name. Um, I want you to be a detective and make it an adventure because you never know what you will find. Now, I wanted to show you something that I found and I want to, to kind of show you how to put together information out of documents. This from, from when you go to a military um, search engine, which I use what's called Fold3 that's up there. There's lots of archives that you can use. Fold3 seems to have the most military archives. Um, and you look at the wars and engagements and you begin to find records. Now, these records I wanna show you, and this kind of will give you just a little hint of how you take records and put them into a story to write a book about. Now, these records actually, they come from the Civil War. They're my husband's family, as you'll see, one's Daniel Knight, one's James Knight, and one's William Knight. These are actually Confederate records where they joined Calvary Company C. They were in the first floor to Calvary, and they enlisted on October 17th, 1861. If you look at every single one of them, in the middle it says where they enlisted, which was Middleburg on October 17th, 1961. Um, so we have three what they are is there's one, there, Daniel Knight would be a cousin to the two brothers, which are James and William. And we follow them. And by records, we're looking, we're putting in names, lots of records are coming up. And then I find a battle where all three of them become prisoners of war. And it was in Missionary Ridge. Two of them actually die. One dies in a military hospital. The other one dies as a prisoner of war. So there's only one left. That one, I find a military, a letter, handwritten letter from him, from um, Daniel Knight back to some of the, he was writing to the families of the um, generals and the, the people, the lieutenants, the ones that had been captured who he knew that had loved ones at home that were concerned and he was basically telling them last evening two commissioned off and this is what the this is what happened and how we came about that this last evening two commissioned officers of this command knights and roberts who were captured at the late battle of missionary ridge arrived in this camp having escaped from the enemy the convoy they convey the information that colonel stockton Bullock and Maxwell and Captain Shine Burroughs, and indeed all of the officers captured were unhurt with the exception of Lieutenant Stevens of the first, first Florida who was mortally wounded. So that letter is documented there that you can find in this in these military records. So by finding this, that's just one more piece of the puzzle that we can make a story out of. And what I'm trying to get to is to show you how we come up with a story. So what story out of this can we write? Now I'm going to elaborate a little, but this is not, this is what we really have to think about or how we can take the information from those documents to write about it. And I just put, this is quick. I just put it together. It says on October 17, 1861, two brothers, Williams and James Knight, James Knight kissed their mother goodbye. You know, they're going to kiss their mom goodbye. So that was easy to put in mounted their horses and rode some five miles to Clay Hill to Middleburg, Florida, where they met their first cousin, Daniel B. Knight. All that enlisted, all of them listed in the company C of first Florida's Calvary. Daniel B. Knight, the oldest of the three, would take command under Captain Somerville as the third lieutenant. The brothers, James, would be commissioned a sergeant and William, 
the youngest a private. Just over two years later, they would find themselves at Missionary Ridge, Tennessee, one of the bloodiest battles in the Civil War. After two full days of fighting, the third would prove to be devastating. James suffered serious injuries, injury allowing for his capture. Next, or, next, like most of the regiment, William fell to his enemy. Um, ultimately, all who survived were captured by the Yankees and sent to prison camp in Kentucky. During the night, Lieutenant Daniel B. Knight joined. I can't. Hold on. I got to move this because. Y'all's pictures were in the way. During the night, Lieutenant Daniel B. Knight joined forces with Roberts and escaped the guard, making their way back to the Confederate line, reporting the condition of his fellow captors. All were well, as could be expected, with the exception of one mortally wounded. See, now that's how I took all of these of the information that I had and worked it into a story. Now, you can go on, you can document every single battle they had. This was just taking two records, um, the record of their entry, the record of the battle, and seeing what happened to them, where they were, and, and so on. Um, now, I do say, once you start this, if you start looking with all the genealogy to beware, because it is an addiction. 20,000 hours was no joke when he, Rich said that after 20,000 hours, it literally, I have 20,000 hours documented and it really hasn't stopped. It's just a different type of, of, of research that I'm looking at now. So beware if you get, a, get into it, just know, know your boundaries, know what you need to know for your book. You may not want to bury yourself like I did. Um, it can be, it, it can be a lot. <laughs> so that's what I have for about research. Does anybody have any questions? So Catherine, when you're doing a typical book, how long does it take you to do research for a book? Well, I didn't, I got, like I said, remember I, last slide it talked about addiction. That, um, hold on one second. I'm not, I've lost my screen. Oh, Lordy. Can y'all see me? See because you. I can't see any of you. <laughs> oh, or maybe that did. Okay, sorry. Um, talking about um, how long did it take? Yeah, it, it, it was a lot. Um, I started in researching in 2007. It started with my father-in-law who asked me a question about someone in his ancestry. Quickly, it took me back to the 1600s where I found an African woman. Um, her name was Margaret. Cornish and I had to know everything about her. Um, whether you want to get so involved is up to you as the author, what your story is. I had to know where she came from, who she was, how she got there, what was her journey, what did she eat, what did the plants smell like when she went on a walk. I went all the way in. So you need to really determine beforehand, before you you know, bury yourself of really how much do you want to know? Because there's so much out there. It's for you to find. There really is. You can, that's, it's got to be determined by, by the author that's writing about it. Now I, I started in 2007. I published my first book December of 2014. And then I published one every two years after that. And I've, um, I've written, um, well, I shouldn't say two years. I've, I've, I've done five in the last, since 2015 or two, you know, right at the end of 2014. It's, it's a lot. And what I did though, was I, I've, I wrote everything as a nonfiction with all my research, but I hated it as a researcher. I hated it because it didn't really tell the story that I wanted to tell. I wanted you to know what these people endured. I wanted you to know 
um, other than reading it about it in a document. I wanted you to, to know what they felt, their feelings. So mine ended up being a trilogy that I turned into a fiction series. Um, but I felt that was the best way to convey it. The reason it turned into fiction, it was still, I held true to my genealogy and my research. It's about 95% factual. The reason it turned out to be fiction is because it's written in first person. And I had no, I have no idea, you know, what they said, but I felt like it conveyed the story better. So I do have the series written in, in a novel series. And then I have a research companion that basically gives it all the information regarding that, which is the documentation, the part that I have to have for the genealogist in me. You guys have a question right now? I have a comment um, that I'd like to share because I love history too. And I weave a little history into my books, even though my books are juvenile fiction. I want kids learning some history. One of the lessons I learned that's been very, very helpful is when I, I always visit a place particularly a historic place that I'm going to put in my books before I, before I put it into my story. My main reason is I want to make sure it's family friendly because one of my goals is I want kids to read my books and read about a place and then want to go there and see it for themselves. And I don't want to put something in the book, uh, a place, a location or a person that's not going to be family friendly. And I've had that happen when I was doing research on uh, a book in Charleston. I thought the original Charlestown um, site there that was the original place, which is not where the main city is located today, looked great online. And then when I got there, it just, it, it wasn't family friendly. And so it didn't go in the book. But um, what I really wanted to say was, whenever I go to a place, I try to make friends with one of the experts there. Uh, my book that takes place in Boston, I visited the Paul Revere House, I visited the Old North Church and the USS Constitution, that magnificent ship in uh, Boston Harbor. And at each place I would introduce myself to basically the staff if I hadn't connected with them online or by phone before I got there. And I'd ask to meet, tell them what I was doing. I'm researching a book and I'd like to meet someone that could answer some questions for me. In all three of those places, I met people that I was able to ask questions, get information from them, and then the most important part was get their phone number and their email address. And when I got back and I was working on the book, and sometimes you know how we write ourselves into a corner, and then we got to figure out oh, now where am I going? I could always pick up the phone or usually I'd send an email because I'm very respectful of people's time, send them an email with the very specific question that I had um, so that I, I made sure what I was putting in my book, my story was accurate. And it's been a wonderful connection, a relationship. And it's, it's helped me with every book where I've done research to be able to go back to the well again and ask more questions. Um, and I feel like I'm getting, um, I'm not sure you'd call that a primary source, Catherine, but it's stuff that I can refer to and feel comfortable that I'm getting good, solid information. And several times I've verified it elsewhere. So I'd strongly suggest that if you're going to be doing any research about people or places, number one, you got to visit the place. Uh, but number two, make a friend, uh, get a connection with someone there that you can go back to. It's helped me in several other ways. Um, I'm going up to, to Boston leaving next week um, and I'm going to be researching on another book. And I called my friends back at the Old North Church because uh, my husband and I are going to attend an event there Wednesday night, night called The Lighting of the Lanterns. If you remember, that was uh, on April 18th when Paul Revere made his midnight run. It was because there were lanterns, one if by land, two if by sea. And they're doing a big ceremony there. And so we're going up there. And I was able to pick up the phone and call the Old North Church and get some good information. And uh, it's, it's going to be nice to be able to ask the questions I want. I've actually set up a private tour for my grandkids who are going to be up there, too. This never would have happened if I hadn't made those connections. Um, well, that book came out in 2015. So 
quite a few years ago. So it's very valuable when you can do that. And I would strongly suggest that um, everybody adopt that. She's very right. One of the um, techniques that I talked about in one of the first slides, I said the geographical technique in literally going to the place you're writing about. Jane is dead on. She is, that is so, I should have talked about it. Um, I, ha I went to Jamestown because that's where um, I was told originally that the first Africans landed. However, that's not the case. Research shows differently. However, um, when I went to Jamestown, you look out over the James River. I had no idea this river was as huge as, it, as I thought it. I thought it was much narrower. I did not know the width of this. It's at least a mile across. Um, and then you think back to the 1600s, which is what I was working and researching is how long did it take them to get from one plantation to another up and down the river? That was their only main um, means of transportation other than by foot. And you weren't going to cross a river swimming. So um, it is very important to know so that it, it does feel true to the story because you may have a reader go and say, hey, there's no way she walked across that. <laughs> when she would have had to take in a, you know, some type of ship to get across, literally. So it does, geography, geography is important to your story, to know where the places that you're actually talking about. Yes, Richard, unmute, you need to unmute. Uh, yeah, um, it just seems that this is a, a terrible lot of work. You know, I'm a disciplined person, I like to write and do all my writing, but this research, you can, how much can you just do with the, um, with the uh, computer? Uh, I've I've written a number of books, and uh, I guess I've gotten all my research the lazy way, just through uh, Google and all of that. You can measure rivers, you can measure distances. I've written about novels set in China and a uh, uh, hundred years ago in New York. I mean, you, you could even if it's not, um, I guess, not perfect like you you guys seem to do. You guys sounds like you're very good researchers, but uh, it just seems like a lot of work when you can just go right to the um, to Google or am I, am I not seeing something here? No, you, you can directly go to Google. Um, it's there, there's something to say when you go to the actual site, there's something, there's a feeling there's, there's something about it. Yes. You absolutely can measure now, um, on Google earth and see how wide that river is. You can, there's all kinds of stuff, which actually my husband has taught me, he's an engineer and he gave me basically the same speech that you just did, Richard, <laughs> saying you can do it. You can do it on, um, on the internet now without question, but there's something just to be said when you actually visit that area that you're writing about. Sure. Um, that's, yeah. you know, my two cents of it, but, it, it's helped me tremendously. And then you do make contacts. That painting that's up there um, yep. that I showed you, actually, it's, it's displayed at Jamestown. It's displayed in several museums, the Smithsonian, the Hampton History Museum. It's, there's, it's, it's displayed many places now, and those were through contacts that I made. Also going up there and realizing that the, they had actually landed not in Jamestown, but in Hampton, that's when I was asked to curate the Hampton um, exhibit for the landing of the first Africans. So those connections are huge. Mm -hmm. Now, genealogy has taken me way to another world because I do genetic genealogy. I've made a database of the first Africans. You can take whatever you are working on, whatever, and you're researching. You can go as far with it as you want. Mm -hmm. It is endless. Okay. Um, it just is a matter of how much time do you have? What is your time frame? When I started to work on it, I didn't know I was writing a book. The book part came way after the fact that I had found out who this woman was. I was just doing genealogy for my father-in-law so he would know what his family history was. And then I come across this whole story that had never been told. And actually the story was wrong. They had said that the first Africans were enslaved and they weren't. There's ev documented evidence out there um, but you have to, you have to really look, and this is another case of preponderance of evidence. If you have something in 1635 that says that a, um, it's a release of indenture, and it's basically said that he, a 
African is being released from his indenture by my own hand and it's signed by his master. Now, for him to be indentured at the time, he was seven years. You back up that seven years from 1635, you're at 1628. What happened in 1628? Well, the purse, there was something that happened that spurred him for hit that indenture to be made. So, I mean, I don't want to get into the whole story of it. It's huge, but you have to kind of read into the evidence when it says that the indentures being released in 1635, you have to know how long was the indentures at the time, the indentures were seven years. So you back that up and what happened then? So you really have to trace it and become an investigator. So and, if, I understand, if I understand you correctly, sorry, that means you're, uh, you're writing mostly uh, uh, nonfiction or fiction or both? I have written now um, nonfiction. I start out with nonfiction. I turn some of my nonfiction into a novel, a, a trilogy, and it's, it's fiction because, like I said, it was written in first person because I wanted the story to be told a certain way. Um, I, I've written in historical journals, I've written in science journals, I've written um, in genetic genealogy journal. Mm -hmm. I have, I've, I've written a lot and that's something else. I don't feel like if you have a specific, um, like genealogy, if you have that, genealogy can go lots of places because now I've written with Jane and we just in January released a children's book. So you can take that specific, um, in my case, genealogy, and you can go to every genre and write in it. I know that people say, oh, there's a lot of publishers out there. They'll tell you that they want their author to stick with it. And yes, if you're sticking with a certain um, genre, you are building up your clientele. You're building up your readers. But as a genealogist, we can go almost to any of those genres and write within them because of our ability for research and, and, you know, the stories that we find. So it's, it, as a genealogist, it is a little different than the, the normal historian who would probably write history as a genealogist. I didn't want to write not, um, fiction. That's not what a genealogist does. It, it, it's nonfiction. If you can prove it, it's genealogy. If you can't, it's mythology. So, I really I had to take a big um, step as a genealogist to write fiction because it, it's called out as fiction. And it's a lot for a genealogist really to stomach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it was important to tell the story and that's why I did it. Okay. Anybody else? Catherine, I have a quick question. Sure. I really appreciate your presentation. So if you wanted to find out more of like current uh, patterns and trends for elementary school children in diet and things like that. How would is the, what would be the best way for me to find out how um, current um, activities are being done successfully um, or unsuccessfully around the U.S. or around the world in particular eating patterns and things like that? I would start with number one, Google. Google is going to pick up science journals. Um, if there's already been any type of research done, um, that's where probably I would start is just Googling the information. Um, I'm trying to just to think there's a lot of field research that goes into what you're talking about in data analysis. Um, there's people that's going to have to be going in and seeing what these kids are eating or what their dietary issues are. So there, there's, there's a lot of government agencies. Um, there's a lot of government agencies that deal with health, uh, both at the state level and the national level. Uh, it's, it's going down a rabbit trail. Literally, you're going to start with one and right. look at some of the sources that they list. Uh, I do a lot of that research right now. I'm doing it on kids reading and what are their reading levels at different grade levels. And it's amazing uh, when I Google some topics and I think, oh, this is perfect. And it's not. But if I dig into it a little bit and I get down to some of their references, uh, it's amazing where it can take you. So it, it just takes time and you just got to do your homework. And once you look at their references, make sure you go to that reference and look at it because they can publish things incorrectly. Um, I, 
I'd like to suggest that when you Google, you use Google Scholar, mm -hmm. which brings up uh, the scholarly journals because a Google brings up a lot of information that is not reputable. Um, and Google Scholar kind of cuts through that. Right. That's Thank you. very true. Thank you. Also, you can Google just books as well. And that will be helpful. That'll pull up your journals and stuff with JSTOR. All right. Thank well, you. Thank you, Catherine. It was very informative. And thank you, everyone, for participating tonight. Uh, next month, we're going to have Arlene Miller, the Grandma Diva. She's a best-selling Amazon author. You can probably see her on your screen now. She does a lot more than just write. She also does presentations. Hear all about that next month. So if everybody's satisfied and no more questions, thank you very much again, everyone. We'll see you next month. Thank you so Bye. much, Catherine. We appreciate Bye. it. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody.